Luis, talk to me about your American dream. My dream has been, well, has switched. I mean, at first it was just to get an education. At this point is to have a, a, a real impact in the world. responsible in no small part for part of something which for many of us really is frustrating when we're online and uh, yet <laughs> it's something that has really been revolutionary and has been so helpful talk about captcha and recaptcha mm -hmm. if, if people haven't seen this is these distorted characters that you have to type all over the internet whenever you're buying tickets on Ticketmaster or getting an account on Facebook I invented that and so how did you come up with this and what did you do with it? Well, this started in the year 2000. Um, it, it all started, I was a first year PhD student at Carnegie Mellon University. And um, I went to a talk by a guy who at the time was the chief scientist of Yahoo. Uh, he talked about a problem that they didn't know how to solve, which was there were people who were writing programs to obtain millions of email accounts from Yahoo. And they didn't know how to stop that. And then um, I went home, I thought about it, I talked to my PhD advisor, um, and we both came up with the solution, which is a test that can distinguish whether the, the, the thing that's getting an account is a human or a computer program. Um, so we came up with this test and the idea is, um, the test is just, we present these distorted characters, it turns out humans can read them better than computers. So that's how we know that you're a human, if, we, if, if you can read those. Then uh, a few years passed and pretty much every website started using it. Uh, and every time that I would go to a, a party or something, people would ask me what I did. And I, you know, I would tell them that, that, that I invented that. They immediately hated me and I apologized. Um, <laughs> and then I did a little back of the envelope calculation that approximately 200 million CAPTCHAs were typed by people around the world every day. So I thought, okay, can we do something good with that time? See, during those 10 seconds, while you're typing a CAPTCHA, your brain is doing something amazing. Your brain is doing something that computers cannot yet do. This is where reCAPTCHA came, is, is this second go around. Um, it occurred to me that while you're typing a CAPTCHA, we could actually get, get you to help us digitize books. And so what we started doing is we started taking all of the words that the computer could not recognize in the book digitization process, and we started sending them to people around the world while they were typing a CAPTCHA. So whenever you typed a CAPTCHA, those words that you were typing were words that were directly coming from a book that was being digitized that the computer could not recognize. And, um, and Google bought it for their book digitization process. And now uh, we, made, we made something good out of something very annoying. You pretty much could have retired. You were set. And it yet, was. you immediately embarked on a new project. I did. And it's what I'm still working on. This was, this was nine years ago. I started working on this project called Duolingo, which is a way to learn languages. Um, it's by now the most popular way to learn languages in the world. And uh, yeah. 300 tried. million people that, have, that are using Duolingo? Yes. There are more people learning languages on Duolingo in the United States than there are people learning languages in the whole U.S. public school system. Historically, when you wanted to learn another language, you would buy $500, $1,500 programs that uh, you could use to learn that language. How much does it cost someone to learn another language from A to Z full through Duolingo? Well, you know, when I started Duolingo, I was in this very fortunate position in my life that I had just sold my previous company to Google. And I wanted to do something that was related to education. Um, uh, but... Uh, my views on education are very related to the fact that I'm from Guatemala. I was born there. And it's a very poor country. And a lot of people talk about education as something that brings equality to different social classes. But I always saw it as the opposite, as something that brings inequality. Because what happens in practice, particularly in poor countries, is that people who have a lot of money can buy themselves the best education in the world and therefore continue having a lot of money. Whereas people who don't have very much money barely learn how to read and write. So I wanted to do something that would give equal access to education to everybody. Um, but education is very general, so I decided to concentrate on teaching one thing, which is languages. And in particular, languages were very interesting because particularly knowledge of English is, it can really transform people's lives. So I thought, okay, let's make a way to teach languages that was entirely for free. And so we did that. And so when we launched, Duolingo was first a website, then an app, 
where you can just learn languages entirely for free. Now, of course, uh, we have to find a way to make money. And so we do make money to, to sustain the whole operation. Um, but the way that we make money is that you can use it entirely for free, but uh, at the end of some lessons, you have to see an ad. And so what's happening today is 97% of our users uh, don't pay us. They just learn for free. And 3% of our users do pay us. Um, but fortunately, um, we have so many users that even though only 3% of our users pay us, this year, uh, Duolingo is going to make approximately about somewhere between 180 and $200 million. Um, and it, it was recently valued at $1.5 billion. Is that what I read? It, it was recently valued at $1.5 billion, yeah, last year. Growing up, were you someone who was thinking about mathematical equations as a kid in Guatemala? Very early on, I, I was not. Uh, when I was eight years old, I wanted a Nintendo. And my mother did not buy me a Nintendo. Instead, she bought me a computer. And I was very upset at her because what I, all my friends had a Nintendo. And I, I didn't have a Nintendo. I, have, I had this thing that was a computer. And she said, I've heard you can play games with this. And uh, I said, okay. And, but of course I was by my, she didn't know how to use a computer. To this day, my mother still doesn't know how to use a computer. She didn't know how to use a computer. She just gave it to me. And I lived just with her. It was just the two of us. And so I didn't know how to, how to figure it out, but she got me the manual for it. So I kind of just read the manual and eventually I figured out how to play games with it. And um, I think that that really forced me back then also computers were much harder to use. Um, so that's probably what forced me to start getting into computers, at least. Just, um, I think in retrospect, this was a very good idea on my mother. Uh, but at the time, I was very upset at her. Luis, would you say that your experience growing up in Guatemala really kind of made you who you are? I, I am who I am entirely because of where I'm from. I, I would not be working on, on language education if I had been born here in the United States, most likely. Because, I mean, for me, having learned English completely transformed my life. You know, Guatemala City, you know, I love it, of course. I, I'm from there and there's always the childhood dreams. But uh, Guatemala City is a city where you can, you can, you can be in a, in a mansion and uh, a drive half a mile and you are in one of the poorest neighborhoods in all of you know, Latin America. Uh, so it is impossible to, to ignore. I happen to go, uh, I mean, bless my mother. She, she, basically, my mother spent all her resources on my education. So what that meant is I went to the, the best school in Guatemala City, which of course meant that's where the, the, that's where the very rich kids went. I was not one of them. And you, you could see this huge disparity even inside the school. And some of, some of them were my friends. Some of the very uh, lower income kids were my friends. And uh, I remember distinctly one of them uh, oftentimes was not going to have dinner that night. So I think socioeconomic disparity is, is, is a huge problem. I think it's one of the biggest problems in the world. And education really can change someone, but also change that family for generations. Just education. Yes. You know, right now we've been mainly teaching languages with Duolingo. We're starting to teach other things. For example, we just launched um, a new app called Duolingo ABC. And what it does is it teaches young kids how to read. A significant fraction of people in, in Guatemala uh, or countries like Guatemala never really learn how to read. Or if they do learn how to read, they don't learn how to read very well. Um, and that is kind of one of the first few things that holds people back. What's and the concept they, behind that, Luis? Why? Uh, I'm trying to make it so that we can have a free way for everybody to learn a language in the world. I mean, we're just getting started with this, but but really the goal is is to make a dent in in worldwide illiteracy rates. I see. Right now, it's geared at kids, kids Where's ages three to six, um, that uh, they like. You know, they they feel like they're playing a game, but as they're playing a game, they're learning how to read, and and that's the idea. When you look down the road five or ten years, are, are there things that you see that could be as revolutionary as Duolingo was for, for language or, you know, the internet was for communication? Education in general. We're already seeing it with COVID. Uh, a significant fraction of the world's children are now being educated online. Many things that probably can be taught better by a program than by a teacher. Not everything. I think teachers are extremely valuable. I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to get rid of teachers. You're uh, a teacher yourself. Uh, I am a teacher myself, so I'm not trying to get rid of teachers at all, but there are certain things that just the computer can just do a better job. The reason is because the computer can give you personalized attention and also doesn't get bored by watching you do the same exercise over and over and over and over again, which there are some things that that's just how you learn how to do. Luis, talk to me about your American dream. 
well, I came to the United States when I was uh, for college. I came, I came to the United States for college. And, and the reason I came, it's a funny reason. I, I came because I wanted to study math. And there was not a great way to study math in Guatemala. Pretty quickly, I realized this was just a very different country um, where there was so much more social mobility. I, I mean, had I stayed in Guatemala, I just could not have accomplished what I, what I was able to accomplish here. Um, and so my, my dream has been, well, it has switched. I mean, at first it was just to get an education. At this point is to have a, a, a real impact in the world. Um, and, and I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm working towards that. Luis, thank you very much. It's been fascinating to speak with you. Uh, these four years have gone by since we last spoke and uh, I learned something uh, from you every single time. Much admiration to you, Luis. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. And uh, as always, uh, amazing to talk to you.